speaker, um, who is Matt Getz. Um, Matt is a grad student at University of Chicago and at University of Pittsburgh. Somehow at both places at the same time, must be confusing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he is going to talk about a circuit-based theory of the impact of cortical state on information flow. So if you can get your slides ready, Matt. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, great. Can everybody hear me okay? Looks great. Sounds great. Perfect. All right, so I'll jump right in. And um, so the motivation for uh, the study is that uh, changes in cortical state are related to changes in behavior. So for example, um, the hit rate of a rodent performing a sound detection task uh, shown by this green line varies as a function of its arousal state. Uh, similarly, um, with attention, uh, the performance of an animal performing a discrimination task varies as a function of its uh, as a function of its attentional state, as shown by the you know the variance in these three lines. Um, but importantly to neuroscientists, right, these uh, state changes are coincident with changes in circuit activity. Uh, and so, for example, in arousal, one might see a change in the response gain. You know, with attention, one might see a, uh, a change in the correlations. And so, taken together, this anticipates how we expect neural processing metrics to change. And in particular, the, the, the metric that we're interested in here is the linear Fisher information, which is um, a measure of the smallest change in a stimulus that can be reliably discriminated by an optical linear decoder. And you might be familiar with it, uh, with this form here, where F prime is the response gain and sigma is the uh, response covariance. And while some fancy nonlinear decoder might do a better job, uh, we like this um, because it also has a clear biological instantiation through uh, synaptic weights. And so the question we're after is how cortical state affects information flow. And so we need to uh, set up some assumptions and, and basis for, uh, for building our model. And the first thing is that state changes can be local or global. So we're considering things like feedback drive and neuromodulation. Um, but axiomatically, uh, we're gonna assume that state changes only affect circuit activity independent of a stimulus for some external inputs. So if we consider a nonlinear EI rate model um, where we have EI pairs oriented around a ring we're position on that ring, corresponds to a unit's uh, preference, uh, preferred value of a tuning variable theta, then we can introduce a modulation as either a uniform current drive or a change in the connectivity strength. And so if we simulate this model, we see that in the unmodulated regime, we might have a response profile for the excitatory units that looks like this. And with modulation, in this case, we're seeing a reduction in the rates. And we can go ahead and calculate the gain. And we see a reduction in this case and the covariance. Uh, and again, we see a reduction with, uh, with the modulation. And now if these changes were unique to some state change influencing a behavior, we would expect information to reflect that. And so recall the definition of Fisher information we're using. And of course, these are the two metrics that, that factor into this equation. Of course, both are changing quite dramatically and yet Fisher information does not. And so it turns out that this is true in general. And so the first thing we wanna do is understand why. And to drive some intuition, we're gonna to go to a reduced model. So we're just gonna simplify the network down to a single EI pair. And it's important to, to note that we're linearizing around the steady state solution of a nonlinear rate model. And so in particular, given a stimulus, a neuron, or if you wanna think about it as a mean field, uh, isotune population is responding variably around some mean rate. And the only way to perturb away from that is to introduce a modulus. So noise is not so big that we're perturbing off of our operating point. And so now the EI population is defining a joint probability distribution over the rates. And one can visualize that here with the 95% confidence intervals um, over the rates responding to a stimulus S and a perturbation of that stimulus delta S. And now modulation can change the shape or the position of these distributions. So to example, moduli say might rotate these distributions or rescale them. Um, but yet by the linearity of our system and decoder, the overlap in the, or the error, right? Um, of a discriminator is not changing through each of these states. And this sort of gets at this invariance. But yet this picture might be a little disconcerting because what does our decoder mean if we're reading out from both uh, E and I? We know that E cells are the primary projection units along the cortical hierarchy. And so if our decoder is, is uh, representing a downstream region, then really the picture should look more like this. And in fact, this corresponds to a projection of these distributions down onto the excitatory axis. And now we see that the distributions over the excitatory rates 
can change as a function of our modulation. In this case, the error is going down. And so now we can see an improvement in information. And since our decoder is restricted to a subset of the population, we're gonna call this a subpopulation code. And so we see that FI can change if we consider subpopulation codes, but now we're interested in addressing how can FI change. And so to that, we're gonna parameterize our network. And we're basically taking the same model, but now we're writing it down with external parameters that uh, feed into the network and network parameters, which define how the network responds. And so again, we'll look at Fisher information. And if we write it down for the whole system and work through the algebra, we see that FI only depends on the external parameters, which are not allowed to change with modulation. And so this is why in general, FI is gonna be invariant. But if we formally define our subpopulation code restricted to E as FIE, then now when we write um, the expression as a function of these network parameters, we see that the dependence on network parameters is maintained, but depends, or the dependence is through some function X. And so X is given by this expression here. And what you notice is that X is only composed of parameters that are highlighted in blue here, and those correspond to the inhibitory population, despite the fact that E is what's being decoded from. And as a result of this, we call X the normalized, or X really is the normalized projection weight from I to E. And so we call X the effective coupling. Now, if we split the input parameters into those which act on E and those which act on I, then the subpopulation codes can become effectively feed forward in terms of X. And we can take this complicated recurrent network and rewrite it like this. And so now to develop a little bit of an appreciation of what X is doing, um, first, we're just gonna note that X has reduced the effective parameter space. So we went from having to consider six different network parameters down to one hyperparameter. And just to develop our intuition for what uh, the effect of X, we're gonna consider uh, the effect of varying inputs to I. So we're gonna um, change the correlations with E and a stimulus. So start with this picture here where I is only receiving noise. Um, then we can write down FIE as a function of X and the input noise correlations. And we see right away that FIE is maximized for some high value of noise correlations and non-zero value of X. And the reason for this is that if the input uh, noise is highly correlated between E and I, I is just feeding that forward to E with a minus sign. And so if these, uh, these noise sources are highly correlated, then tuning X can effectively cancel that um, correlation with E, therefore optimizing information. Uh, for that reason, we call this the correlation cancellation regime. Um, but by contrast, if I now receives a signal, then this picture changes quite a bit. And we see that X is maximized mm -hmm. at low values. And this, this makes sense because now I is effectively canceling signal. And so the optimal thing to do is to shut down I, right? And so for that reason, we call this the gain reduction regime. But the second case might make you a little uncomfortable because we know that I also plays a stabilizing role. And so if we fix the parameters in our network with some uh, exemplar, then we can draw the uh, instability boundaries on our network and these are going to depend on the full network. So X is not getting away from this. We still need to fully consider the stability of our network in order to appreciate the bounds on X as well. So the next question, or really just the last question because I um, spoke quite rapidly, is that how will these subpopulation codes generalize? So you know, we've, we've gone through this in just a singular EI network um, but we know that the brain is, is a lot higher dimensional than that. And, and the short answer is well. So if we look back at the original ring model, then the one dimensional X that we described earlier has a natural extension to uh, N dimensions and it has a, the, the matrix analogous form. But it's important to note that subpopulation codes are not unique to an EI partitioning. So we motivated this by thinking about the excitatory propagation of um, information across uh, cortex in a picture that resembles this. But the truth is that cortex is a lot more complicated than that. And so you might have sets of recurrently connected excitatory units, only a subset of which project to some downstream region. And so in this case, the picture looks a little bit more like this. And our theory extends to this case as well, where X rather than only depending on I parameters is gonna depend on the unobserved network parameters. And so, to conclude, uh, what we've seen is that in a linearized framework, the total information flow is invariant to state changes. 
and subpopulation codes better reflect anatomy and allow for information increases with state change. The caveat is that one must know the downstream projection profiles of certain cells to appreciate how changes in activity affect information flow. And so with that, I just want to thank uh, my co-authors on this project, Brent Golan, Chen Chen Huang, as well as everybody who's helped out. And we do have a working draft of this. Um, it's going through final edits. And so if you want to let, uh, find out when we post it or get a copy, just shoot me a quick email. And thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. You can all hear me clapping, but I'm sure there are a lot of other people elsewhere who are doing it at the same time, too. So uh, you just have to imagine those two. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, maybe I'll start us off with uh, just a single question. Um, so you motivated this as being, as an example, for example, with attention um, being something that causes a, a state change. Is, is that kind of the, the kind of paradigm that you think of specifically with this? And if so, are there any specific brain areas that would be more relevant for? Or? Um, yeah, so I think broadly, I'm thinking about anything that causes, um, um, right, a, a, a perturbation in the, in the set point of a cortical circuit. So it could be pretty much anywhere. Um, I do think about this in sensory systems, mainly because that's where a lot of this, uh, this data comes from, say in, you know, in arousal studies or attentional studies. Um, but I think it's pretty flexible. And so that last slide, for example, came from a motor area. Right. Sure. Uh, with the pathway splitting. Yeah. Right. So there's a question from the Q&A. Uh, uh, Reina is asking, interesting talk. I was wondering how this change in a nonlinear regime or would you consider full mutual information instead of fissure information? That's interesting. Uh, I'm not that? actually sure that I got the, what, the, what they mean by full nonlinear. Oh, you mean like not using linear fissure? Yeah, so if, you, if you're not using fissure. Um, yeah, that's that's a good question, and I actually haven't I haven't worked out the math for that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're expecting you to have worked out all, so you know, don't yeah. feel bad about that. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Any other thoughts on that, though? Or yeah, um, oh, should we leave it as as a, for future research? Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's hard to say, right? So it's not that I'm being lazy by using linear regimes. It's just that. Um, you know, if you think about cortex as asynchronous, or if you think about things like tuning curves, um, you know, those come from operating point sort of solutions that are linearizable, but generally, because we don't think that noise in the brain is so big that we can't compute a tuning curve. Um, and so in that context, I think that a lot of these assumptions are quite reasonable, actually. Um, and, but I do, so thinking about like mutual information, I know that, you know, there is quite a bit of literature. Um, I think, uh, Nicola Brunel, for example, back in the 90s was talking about the relationship between fissure information and mutual information. And so I might refer to, to a project like that um, to gain some insight into that, that question. Um, but generally, fissure information is sort of the, the, um, the small delta limit, I guess, of discriminability, for example, whereas... Um, if I can just cut you off, I think Vina might want a follow-up question on that. Okay. I don't know whether we can put him through a microphone just really quickly. Yeah, sure. Hey, thanks so much. Um, really cool talk. Um, yeah, just to clarify, it was mm -hmm. basically two sub questions. One is what happens if your input signal is so strongly modulated that this linearity assumption doesn't work anymore? Uh -huh. and, and secondly is what happens if you don't consider the um, just Fisher information, but like full mutual information and w like, would you, would you then get a lower bound or an upper bound or can you still say something about that regime, like both numerically or maybe is there like an uh, analytical approximation? I see. Okay. So the first question is, yeah, this, this framework would break down and I don't know. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, as far as full mutual information. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see why it would be a problem. I, I think that this, this would still have relevance. Um, but again, this is something that, you know, uh, no, it, it totally has relevance. I was just wondering like whether, you then overestimate information or underestimate, like what yeah. direction you yeah. basically, I don't have a good intuition for that, like when it's nonlinear. Right, right, likewise. Cool. Yeah, maybe <laughs> we'll, we can chat we'll more file, about We'll file that one under yeah, uh, yeah. Thinking research, okay? Thanks so much again, really yeah. cool work. Anyway, Brilliant. thanks, Bye -bye. yeah. Thanks, Matt. Okay. Um,